challenging topic, and I just have to say right from the onset, I do not feel that I have all the answers. Um, God does, I, I don't. But I, I do hope that as we look at his word, some of the answers to this topic will be made clear to us. So we'll read from Genesis chapter 50, and we'll be looking at the story of Joseph. Joseph and his brothers, and see what God would say to us about suffering from the life of this man. From verse 15 to 21, Genesis 50 says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Many of us know the story of Joseph. Joseph had dreams of leading his brothers as a boy. And this made his brothers jealous. And they decided to sell him into slavery after changing their minds about killing him. Joseph ends up in Egypt where... God's hand was upon him, even in the midst of that very difficult situation of having been betrayed by his own family. Joseph becomes the chief servant for an Egyptian official named Potiphar, and he excels in that role as chief servant. Potiphar was happy to leave everything in the hands of Joseph. Potiphar's wife made sexual advances on Joseph and he refused. And when he refused, she accused Joseph of attempted rape. And Joseph is thrown into jail. Through his God given gift of interpreting dreams and this God given wisdom of finding solutions to, to problems, Joseph is lifted up by God to be the second most powerful person in Egypt. And he's entrusted by Pharaoh to prepare for the famine that God had shown to Pharaoh in a dream. And when the famine started, his father, Israel, in Canaan, hears that you know, there's food in Egypt, so he sends his brothers to look for food in Egypt. And Joseph provides for his family. He gets his father and the whole family to move to Egypt. And we pick up the story after Israel, their father, has died. And the situation now is that the brothers are worried that Joseph is going to take revenge. The thing that was standing in the way of us 
experiencing the full weight of Joseph's vengeance is the fact that daddy was still around. And now that our father is gone, we'll see Joseph's true colors. He's going to come after us. Let's look at who is in control of suffering because Joseph suffered. Can you imagine being betrayed by your own flesh and blood, sold into slavery, wrongly accused of rape, finding yourself in prison? Joseph suffered probably more than many of us have. Let's look at who is in control, who was in control of Joseph's suffering and ours as we unpack this passage under three headings. The first heading is that people do evil. We humans, we do evil. Secondly, we'll see that evil requires forgiveness, that the way God has orchestrated life is that the solution to the problem of evil, how evil affects our relationship with one another and with God, is that there has to be forgiveness. And finally, we'll see that God uses our suffering for good. Let's begin with the first heading that people do evil. Joseph's brothers did evil against him. Would you agree with that? They did evil which caused him to suffer. And in this short passage that we've read, the word evil is actually used three times. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. They were aware that what they did to their brother was evil. It was a conscious decision. Selling him into slavery was an evil thing to do, a choice that they made. Joseph, the recipient of their actions, he also saw what they did as evil because he says to them, as for you, you meant evil against me. Mankind started to do evil to each other and to cause suffering after sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden. After a conscious decision to not obey God's instruction, sin enters the world. Man becomes corrupted at his very core and he begins to cause suffering one to another. What happened between the first brothers on the planet? Before we get to Joseph and his brothers, what happened between the first brothers on the planet, Cain and Abel? Cain got jealous of Abel and he killed his brother. He did evil against his brother. What happened between Israel, the father of Joseph, and his brothers, and his own brother Esau? There was deception, there was cheating, there was pain, there was anger, there was separation, there was evil in that relationship. And only many years later was there restoration of the relationship. Having um, lived in a, a number of different African countries, one of the things I've observed is at the time that somebody dies in, in a family, evil springs up. Relatives are grabbing property from the widow, 
relatives are denying their own flesh and blood. And you're like, man, what, what, what? What is going on here? These people are mourning. These people are broken. And at that time, the very people you think are your close ones, your family, they pounce on you like wolves. And, and I know of several situations. And I've been party to that myself. Remember when my father died? They're like, where does this come from? We are evil. Human beings, we are corrupted. Sin has corrupted our very nature that we are capable of things that you would think, really, did you do that? Oh, yes. You did. Now, in the midst of all this, God is in control because God never said that, okay, because Adam and Eve, you have decided to disobey me. I have decided that I am no longer interested in controlling the universe. In fact, God confronts them right there and he gives them consequences right there, but he also clothes them. He shows them grace, pointing to the fullness of grace that would come in Christ Jesus. But God never said that, okay, because man has decided to go his own way, I've washed my hands of them, off I go. He remains in control. However, the world is now a broken place where evil is part and parcel of life. Bad things happen to all kinds of people. Bad things happen to those that we might say they're good. Like, man, but who's really good anyway? Bad things happen to those that would say they're terrible. I mean, yeah, they deserve it. But we know that God is loving and gracious and merciful, so he comes to those that we would think deserve it. Bad things happen to all of us. And if, if people have caused you to suffer, if you are suffering right now or you have suffered in the past because of something that someone else has done, it is because of the sinfulness that is in all of us. And if you have caused others to suffer, It is because of the sinfulness that is in you. It's very sobering for us as people to really look at ourselves and realize how corrupted we are. And what that should do, it should cause us to look outside of ourselves for a solution. And say, God, where's the answer? He has the answer, as we'll see. What is really interesting as well, as we read the story of Joseph, is that when you're going through tough times, when you are suffering, does it mean that you are out of the will of God? Because it's, it's easy to think that. And in fact, there is, there's probably a, a strong theological view, a, a view of God that says, well, if someone is suffering... It's because God is angry and God is punishing. And, and sometimes that is the case, that we have sown unrighteously, so we are reaping the consequences of our unrighteous sowing. We've done something and here's the consequences of that. We don't minimize that. But, but we also see that sometimes you can be suffering and you are right in the middle of the will of God. Because suffering is a reality of this fallen world that we live in. It's like part of life. Until the kingdom of God fully comes, until Jesus 
returns and fully establishes his increasing coming kingdom, there will be suffering. So it's like, well, it, it's there. So does that mean you are out of the will of God? Suffering is also a part of following in the footsteps of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the one who was born to suffer, the man of many sorrows, if we are truly following in the footsteps of Christ in a dark and fallen world, should it surprise us that we are suffering? Do we have a view of life that says, as a Christian, I am shielded from suffering? I should not suffer because I am in Christ. Christ himself said, in this world, you will face trouble. He encouraged us by saying, but, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So there's, there's an overcoming that Christ has given us. There's, there's victory in Christ, but there is a broken world that we are going through. In the life of Joseph, God allows these evil actions of his brothers against him for a higher purpose. God had in mind something greater than what he could see or what his brothers could see. Chuck Swindle said the following, uh, when you suffer and lose, that does not mean you are being disobedient to God. In fact, it might mean you're right in the center of his will. The path of obedience is often marked by times of suffering and loss. Now, let's do all that we can by the grace of God to ensure that our suffering is not because of our disobedience. And let's be robust to realize that when we are suffering for being obedient to Christ, we are sharing in the life of Christ. We are following in the footsteps of Christ. So the first thing we've seen as we've looked at the life of Joseph, is that we humans, we do evil. We are not good. We are flawed. We are corrupted. We have the image of God in us. That's amazing. But that image has been corrupted by sin at the very core of who we are. The second thing we see is that evil requires forgiveness. What, what did Joseph's brothers do when, when Israel died and what seemed to be the shield between Joseph, now this really powerful man, and them? When he died, what was the response of his brothers? They asked for Joseph's forgiveness. Verses 16 and 17, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. As one reads the story, it looks like things are moving along fine until Israel dies. Then we realize there's an unresolved issue. How does Joseph really feel about us? For years since Joseph had revealed his identity to them, these brothers were carrying something in their hearts. Joseph might decide to take revenge. For Joseph's brothers, if, if true reconciliation was to happen, forgiveness from Joseph was needed. And they hoped that the weight that their father's name carried with Joseph. It's interesting, they say to Joseph, your father, as if he's not their father. 
your father gave this command before he died. Hoping that that would soften the heart of Joseph towards them. Now what is absolutely amazing, at least to me, is that Joseph had already decided to forgive them. When he revealed himself to them years later, he had already made a decision to forgive them. It was a very emotional moment. Very emotional. I mean, Joseph breaks down. But as they interact, you realize that Joseph is not breaking down because he is about to exercise punishment against his brothers. You realize Joseph has not broken down because he's about to show them the full weight of what he is in Egypt and all the pain and anger and resentment that he has carried all these years will now be unleashed. That was not why he was breaking down. Certainly there was an emotion in, in re remembering the pain of what these guys did. They betrayed me. They hurt me. And all these years I've lived apart from my father and, and apart from them. But as he speaks, you realize that this is a man who had already in his mind made a decision not to hold what they had done against him. He forgave his brothers for betraying him, selling him as a slave, even before they asked him. Because in Genesis 45 verse 5, after he reveals himself to them, this is what he says. He says, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. He's saying, guys, it's, it's okay. I, I know you're probably carrying guilt and, and, and pain about what you did to me. It's okay. Do not be angry with yourself. I see that God had a bigger plan in what was happening in my life. What was happening in our lives as a family. But they were not sure if this was genuine. Because when Jacob dies, when Israel dies, they're like, he, he, he's going to take revenge now. He had already said, guys, it's, it's okay. When they asked for forgiveness years later, at the death of their dad, he weeps. He says to them, do not fear. And he asks them this question. For am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? God is sovereign. God is in control. Forgiveness does not mean Joseph forgot what happened. He remembered what happened. Forgiveness does not mean Joseph didn't see what happened to him as wrong. He considered it as evil. That's what he called it. Forgiveness does not mean there was no consequence. There was separation in this family for years. Forgiveness was a decision not to hold what his brothers did against them. And when that decision was made, the emotions would follow. The reconciliation could follow. It, it, it amazes me how Joseph could do this. I, I struggle to forgive over much, much smaller things. I don't know about you. How did Joseph do this? Like, what, what kind of person? What helped Joseph to forgive was this clear understanding that God was ultimately in control of what was happening in his life. He had a sense of the sovereignty of God, of the control of God that was so strong, that was so clear that as he looked at things unfold, God is in control. For am I in the place of God? If you were to ask Joseph who is in control, he would say God. And you would say, hang on, Joseph. 
when your brothers stripped you of that special robe that your father made? Who was in control? Joseph would say, God. What? When, when, when they threw you into the pit and you heard them discussing what they were going to do to you, who was in control? God. What? When, when they sold you into slavery, washed their hands of you, who was in control, Joseph? God. Paul Chapel said, as long as you live on earth, you won't see the end of injustices. Yet God desires for you to let go of injustices and hold on to his grace. Only he can give you the power to forgive those who have hurt you the deepest. Joseph had to let go of the injustices that his brothers had committed against him and hold on to the grace of God. How, how did Joseph hold on to the grace of God? Well, Joseph sees that there is a famine, and in the famine, God sends his brothers to Egypt to look for food. So like, Lord, th those guys who did all those terrible things to me, you actually want to preserve their lives. Yeah. He's showing grace. God is showing grace to those guys, to his brothers. And if, if God was showing grace to them, who was Joseph not to show grace? How else did Joseph see the grace of God in his life? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a slave now, but in my master's house, wow, I'm prospering. I'm in prison now, but in prison, Lord, you are with me. You are using me. Even in the midst of all my suffering, I see your grace. I see your hand. And Joseph holds on to the grace of God and he lets go of the pain. He lets go of the injustice that was caused by his family. And all of us have to do the same. To only let go of the injustice is not enough. We need to let go of the injustice and turn to something greater, to something better. We let go of the injustice and we turn to the grace of God. Lord, your grace is sufficient. Even in this, I will rest in your grace. The greater Joseph, Jesus. Because as you read the story of Joseph, you can't help but feel that it is pointing to Jesus Christ. It's like this is a type of Jesus that lived thousands of years before. The greater Joseph, Jesus, who created the world as we, as we heard last week. And he holds the whole world together. He forgives us. After he was betrayed by one of his disciples, he was denied by another. He was abandoned by the rest. He's condemned to death by his own people. And what does he do with that? He forgives. And because of Jesus' death on the cross, because Jesus was willing to take the punishment that was mine, the punishment that was yours, for the evil that we have done against God and against each other for our sins. Because Jesus was willing to do that, we are forgiven and we can be part of the family of God. He forgives us of our sins, takes our punishment. How could Jesus forgive like that? Jesus forgave because like Joseph, he knew that God is ultimately in control. He knew that God was working out a plan of salvation that wouldn't be clear to the human mind at that time and still baffles the human mind and heart 2,000 years later. And Jesus was willing to fully submit to suffering, to pain, to rejection, to abandonment. 
because he knew that God was in control and he was working things out for the salvation of many. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says these words, perhaps one of his weakest moments. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's an expression of trust in the sovereignty, in the control of the Father. Saying, God, if it were up to me, I don't know if I could do this. And if you might even consider changing things, but I'm willing to submit to your sovereignty. I'm willing to submit to your plan. When Peter gets up to speak on the day of Pentecost, part of his sermon goes like this. This Jesus, Acts 2 verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter is saying, listen, God was absolutely in control of the death of Jesus Christ. He had a plan for Jesus to die for our sins. But you exercised your evil free will to crucify him. And there's this balance, and it's a mystery to me, how does it work together that God is in control, but man, the, the actions of man still really matter in that. It's something mysterious in that truth, but it is the truth. So Jesus comes as the greater Joseph, and he comes to rescue us and save us. And I want to say this to us this morning, my friends. If there is someone that you need to forgive, may the knowledge that God has a plan for the suffering that you went through or the suffering that you are going through, may that be of help to you. May the knowledge that God is in control even when people make harmful choices give us comfort. May they help us towards forgiveness. We need to point out that although Joseph had forgiven his brothers, True reconciliation only happened after they asked him for forgiveness and actually received it. Although it had already been given. True reconciliation only happened when they knew for sure that Joseph actually has forgiven us. And that allowed them to come together as family. And this is also true of God. God offers us forgiveness through his son Jesus. However, for us to be reconciled with God, we need to receive and accept that forgiveness that Christ gives to us through his work on the cross. It's an offer, a gift, but we must receive it. And forgiveness is at the, it's at the center of this amazing universe and how God relates with man. It's like as God controls the world and tries and, and looks to reconcile us to him in his amazing infinite wisdom, he says forgiveness will be at the very center of how I bring my people to myself. And somehow, even in the relationships between us people, forgiveness is such a crucial thing for us to be able to live 
together. We do evil. And that evil leads to the need for forgiveness. Finally, our last heading for this morning is that God uses our suffering for good. We've already alluded to that. Verses 19 and 20. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Amen. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph's suffering led to many people being kept alive. Joseph had already told his brothers of God's plan to use their evil for good when he re revealed himself to them years before. In, in, in chapter 45, he says, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Who sent Joseph to Egypt? God. For good. And, and, and in the next chapter, in chapter 46, it tells us that the house of Jacob had 70 people that went down into Egypt. That's quite a lot of people, isn't it? But if you think 430 years later, when, when, when Israel leaves Egypt, an estimated 2 million or so Israelites come out of Egypt, then surely through Joseph, God kept many alive. Suffering in Joseph's life was part of God's plan to fulfill his purpose for Joseph's life. It was the path of him fulfilling his destiny with regards to what God had called him to do. It was the path to save many lives. God meant it for good. He allowed it for good. He allowed evil human decisions with real painful consequences for good. I think it's John Piper who says that Romans 8 is the New Testament version of the words of Joseph. So I'm going to read Romans 8 um, just very quickly here. Verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. In all things, God is working for good. Rick Warren, a very well-known uh, U.S. church leader, he said, other people are going to find healing in your wounds. Your greatest life messages and your most effective ministry will come out of your deepest hurts. When you go through tough times, God has a purpose for that. Now, we started by saying that there's this argument that if God is good, um, is he really good if there's evil? Can't really be good. Um, can God really be in control if there's evil? Well, he can't really be in control because there wouldn't be evil. Well, th that argument is weakened somewhat when one looks at the outcome of evil. Because we can 
assess the situation midway and say, man, yeah, there's no God. God is not really good. Because look at how bad things are right here. But if we wait, if we are patient, if we allow God to work through the process that he is about and get to here, then we'll realize that actually there is a God. Because after this, when we got here, God worked it out for good. So we need to patiently hold on in faith and trust that God who is in control is at work and he will bring good out of the situation that we find ourselves in. We're coming to a close now. The suffering of the greater Joseph, Jesus, led to many being kept alive, didn't it, as well? And, and it's not being kept alive physically. It's the suffering of Jesus led to many being kept spiritually alive. We, are, we were dead in sin, but now we're alive to God. We were dead. We are now new creations. We are born again. We've been renewed by the Spirit of God. We were unaware of who God was. We were rebels living in our own way. And, and God comes and he, he does something on the inside of us. Points us to the cross and says, there is where my mercy meets with the judgment that you deserved. There is where my grace meets with the punishment that was meant for you. The suffering of of, of Jesus leads to the preservation of many. And, and many are still to come into that family. And we, we are the agents of, of, of Christ. We are his ambassadors who, will, who he will use to bring many into his family. So may God encourage us this morning to see whatever situation we are going through, whatever suffering we are going through, as an opportunity to trust in Him. The world would be a different place if every follower of Jesus really said, Lord, I'm going through this tough time, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do my part, and I'm going to believe that you are working things out for good. As painful as it might be, I will hold on to you because you are ultimately in control. I'd like to give us a moment to respond personally. And um, is Randall close by? He just played some strings. God is in control over there. It's okay. <laughs> so uh, maybe Ima can just play some keyboard background music for us. Just find it helps to at least soothe my heart and get me in a place of being able to reflect more closely on what God's doing. And the question I'd like us to reflect on this morning is who do you need to forgive? Who in your life is a person that has hurt you. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a workmate, maybe it's a situation at work, whatever it might be. But in the midst of all this talk about the sovereignty of God, God being in control, God comes right to our hearts, doesn't he? It's like, I, I see you. I see you. And, um, there might be someone that you need to forgive. Today I am asking you by the grace of God to forgive them. It will probably start as a decision that you have to make in your mind. It will probably be a process. There will be emotions involved in that. But can you, like Joseph, see the bigger picture that God is in control and make a decision to forgive 
And I'd like you to take it a step further. Not only to forgive that person, but to seek reconciliation. Because Jesus came with a ministry of reconciliation to bring together. So what might need to happen is you may need to actually go to that person and say, listen, I have had issue with you on this and this. And I just want to let you know that I forgive you. And I want to live in peace with you. And I want to be reconciled to you. 